Well, hello and welcome to Talk Time. Today we're going to be dealing with an issue which is of most significance to many, many, many people in Ghana and indeed the sub-region and the world at large. We're going to be talking about generally the security situation in West Africa and then we're going to narrow down to Ghana and we shall take a look at the problems in the Volta region or parts of the Volta region and how we may be able to resolve these issues and move forward. We may even be tempted to talk about election 2020 and the prospects for peace. Welcome to Talk Time. Well, welcome back to Talk Time. And today, we're talking about security in West Africa. We are talking about developments in certain parts of the Volta region. And we possibly will be talking about peace towards, during, and after the 2020 elections. Today, we are really privileged to be talking to an expert, to be talking to an advisor of the United Nations, you're talking to one of our own. You're talking to Mr. Emmanuel Bombardi, who has been dealing with peace issues for many, many, many years. Sir, you're welcome to the studio. Thank you so much. It's a privilege to be with you. Yes, sir. Now, sir, what is the general situation in West Africa? I mean, the, the security situation in West Africa. What are the threats to peace in West Africa? Yeah, thank you so much, and uh, let me share my uh, respects and compliments with all your viewers. Uh, let, let me start with a landmark date, December 1989, when the civil war in Liberia started, and then crossed over into 1990, and for a decade, we had the worst form of violence and civil war that afflicted West Africa. Because it moved from Liberia into Sierra Leone, it threatened Guinea almost to the point of total escalation. And then we saw the rivers come back into Cote d'Ivoire. And in the meantime, we saw what happened in Burkina Faso with the collapse and the exit of President Blaise Kampauri, who, as a president of Burkina Faso, played mediation rules in ECOWAS. I use this as a preface to suggest that what we did in the 2000s was to come out of the worst period of the 1990s by building the type of regional cooperative mechanisms that would improve the situation in West Africa. Regrettably, we are going back into the deep abyss of where we came from, from the 90s. And if we are not careful, the security situation in West Africa could even be worse than we saw it in the 1990s. And that is why there is an interconnection in our recent history and what is currently pervasive. As you know, there are countries today who have chosen to make constitutional adjustments that automatically give a sitting president what I might call in quotes a legitimacy to run for a third term. We see it in the Republic of Guinea. We see it in La Côte d'Ivoire. We see other countries almost at the verge of trying to take similar trends. And in the uh, first ECOWA summit on Mali, the new president of Guinea-Bissau, uh, Mr. Ombalu, talked about how, whereas we deal with the coups that take leaders out of office, we should not forget to also pay attention to the coups that change constitutions for president to continue to extend their term in office. This is significant. It is significant because the good governance practices that we put in place, we are beginning to throw them one after the other through the window. Secondly, we cannot say we did not have sufficient lessons that we have learned from this history of the 90s. So if we take a country like Côte d'Ivoire, how is it conceivable that we can be at the brink of more heightened tensions 
before elections on the 31st of October, when for 10 years we had one of the worst civil wars uh, in La Côte d'Ivoire. So these are some of the elements that are visited in the in the face. But let me conclude this uh, response by saying that whilst we are talking about the political governance as I've uh, described it, we have never come out of other threats such as maritime insecurity in the Gulf of Guinea. It improved, but we continue to hear about attacks. Organized crime through the drug trade in which we continue to hear the stories of drug merchants using some of our countries, including Ghana, to land their drugs, distribute elsewhere in Europe and North America. And whilst all this is happening, violent extremism is increasing, radicalization is increasing, and terrorism in the Sahel is now widespread. Our young people, our young people are completely at a loss. They are easily recruited. They have no future. And many of these young people are choosing between trekking through the desert in the conditions of unbelievable suffering or joining some of these terrorist groups in order to be able to make ends meet on a day-to-day -day basis. And so my response is that West Africa is in a very bad situation of security and the threats are real. What about the threat of Islamic insurgency or Islamic insurgency itself in places like uh, Mali, in places like Burkina Faso and Guinea? Uh, th that threat in itself is what has heightened or increased uh, violent extremism and terrorism. Mm -hmm. So first of all, the different jihadist groups are interlinked with their international jihadist partners. And so resources are in abundance. Mm -hmm. When I talked about the drug trade, some of this drug money is used to fuel the resources of these groups. Mm -hmm. But what is happening is, in the period of our development history, some of our countries in the Sahel, particularly when you look at the northern corridors of countries like Burkina Faso, when you look at the Middle Belt, the north of countries like Mali and Niger, the state has actually never been present in some communities. And so these uh, jihadist groups arrive, but first of all, they arrive in a very friendly way. They arrive, they are received in the village, they are received in the community, and in our typical traditional African hospitality, they are welcome. But whilst they are there, they study the environment, and they try to find legitimacy for their attacks later on by trying to suggest that the Islam they see being practiced is inferior, it's not pure. But in this period of recruit, but once they are doing that, they are also recruiting. And using very sophisticated methods of knowing who are the vulnerable young people who can be recruited, and then the attack comes. So the attack comes to destabilize the state, but the victims are the very people who receive them. Mm -hmm. And one of the consequences, and I saw that at first hand, when you go to capitals like Ouagadougou, you see how young people have migrated from these villages into the urban centers. And it's only the old and the weak who are left in these belts. Our countries like the government of Burkina Faso now has to fight off these uh, terrorist jihadist groups. The question is, what is the capability of the armies of our countries to fend these people off. Because in some villages, they even offer primary health care. Mm -hmm. They even assure the villagers that we will provide your, your, your children education. And so they begin to replace the government in providing the social services that have been very difficult for uh, people to have. Mm -hmm. And out of the cultivation of that relationship, they then try to destabilize the state with the aim of not just remaining at that level, but spreading it. And when you look at the security map currently on the whole of West Africa, the color that has been used is red to basically indicate how the entire Sahel is a no-go area. But there's another element we should be uh, talking about. The increasing distrust mm -hmm. between the people now and their government. Because people are beginning to say that enough is enough. 
if the governments cannot protect us, what is the meaning of electing governments? Mm -hmm. And this mistrust is further exacerbated by the multiplicity of actors who are supposed to be partners in supporting our governments to fight off these terrorists and extremist groups. Mm -hmm. And people are asking, why all these years we are not seeing tangible results? If you take Mali, you have Operation Barakani, mm -hmm. led by the French, under their command, and people sometimes make the mistake, they are not under blue helmets, so they are not, they are not part of MINUSMA, mm -hmm. which is the United uh, Nations multidimensional mission in Mali. Mm -hmm. They have their own command structure. Mm -hmm. Then you have the G5 Sahel, which was an initiative of Sahelian countries to come together and respond. But they've never had the resources nor the capacity to be able to uh, respond. Then there is the joint military initiative that includes Chad to try and look at what is happening in the Lake Chad Basin. That has also not been successful. And so when the terrorist groups are aware that we have not been able to subdue them, they become even more emboldened. And that is why uh, the spread of insurgency continues to devastate our region. What about the Nigerian situation with Boko Haram? Would it fit into this broad picture? Yes, so then the northeast of Nigeria fits very squarely into the challenges of the Lake Chad Basin. But keep in mind, it's also unique. Now, when, when we are talking about security, basically to be able to understand what should lead us to peace, we must also have the courage to be honest, to be sincere in diagnosing the problem and for that matter, creating the right responses. Mm -hmm. Whereas on the generality, you have some of the best educated people in the northern parts of Nigeria. It's also true that up to 70% of children at a certain point did not have access to formal education. And so they became more vulnerable to be recruited by these jihadist terrorist groups that we are talking about. Because how did Boko Haram start? The very initial effort was basically what you might call a social revolution to counter marginalization of communities in the northeast of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. But alongside that, came, if you would call it, the jihadist preaching of social justice, which was an affront to some of the political leaders of the Northeast. Mm -hmm. So, Mohammed Yusuf, who was the first originator of this thinking, was combining humanitarian assistance with also a social revolution through engagement, education, and conscientization. And they killed him mm -hmm. in a social function. Ah, that then exacerbated the situation because he will now be succeeded by the most radicals who will now take the war against the state. And they have never turned back, neither have they ever stopped, regardless of the billions of dollars that have been thrown into equipping the Nigerian armed forces to respond. But while this is happening, let's keep in mind that. Apart from the forest of that savannah region, which is conducive for terrorist activity in terms of you hide, mm -hmm. you secure your base, you prepare, you attack. And when there's a counter attack to repel, they know how to go back into their convenient environment and prepare for the next attack. Unfortunately, the Nigerian army and today we should appreciate 60 years of their independence and we wish them well because their team is 60 years together but what is happening is when even these Boko Haram terrorist groups and by the way Boko Haram that has affiliated itself with the Islamic uh, 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 Jihad mm -hmm. are confronted with massive what you would call attack they also have an escape route into the Lake Chad Basin. And so the first element of surprise, which is our own undoing, is our incapacity to understand how we must work together. Mm -hmm. My uh, good senior brother, <coughs> would you believe that the first time on this particular matter that we are talking about, that President Goodland, Goodland Jonathan at that time, 
met with President Paul Bia of Cameroon, was at a security summit in Paris that was convened by President uh, uh, Francois Hollande. Meanwhile, the northern part of Cameroon, parts of Chad, and parts of northeast uh, Nigeria provide the corridor for the active combat activities and terrorist attacks of Boko Haram. Mm -hmm. And yet our leaders, we are in the same area, in the same neighborhood. In most cases, our communities intersect in terms of ethnicity, language, and overwhelmingly religion, mm -hmm. but we are not able to engage one another to provide the type of leadership to respond. We have to go to a metropolis that is a former colonial power to now meet there and define how we should cooperate. So I also use that to talk about our incapacity is not just military, but it's also political. Mm -hmm. And to that extent, uh, the northeast of Nigeria continues to suffer these consequences. And let me quickly add here that all the lives lost in our African traditions, if you take the Nigerian army, for example, try to imagine losing the breadwinner of the house. And last week, one of the commanders was killed in battle, and the uh, federal government has tried to support the family, and etc. But that loss cannot be replaced. So, each loss of life, even from the, or, uh, the, 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 the army, could create a sense of radicalization of people who feel that we are not able to uh, find our way. Not to mention the gruesome attacks. The one in which there was a convoy of vehicles trying to enter Meduguri. The army stopped this convoy to give them security because they did not want them to continue uh, with the fear that they might be attacked on the outskirts of Meduguri. But at dawn, while sitting in the convoy, they were then attacked and completely incinerated. And so people are like, if you were trying to protect us by stopping us, mm -hmm. what have you done? We could have as well continued our journey and face the terrorists enter, uh, whilst we enter Meduguri. Mm -hmm. So it is basically to point out in a very critical way that the time for the conversation has to be critical and also has to have the courage to acknowledge the problem. Otherwise, we continue to go around. And let me add another uh, political event. I was shocked when even in creating the G5 Sahel, some of the Sahelian countries do not want other Sahelian countries to be part of it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I will not be able to reference my source for the purposes of uh, confidentiality. But there was a certain notion that if we create this as a special club, it becomes an entry to huge resources of billions of dollars. Mm. And so, we have a common problem, but we are trying to say, no, you stay away. <laughs> because this is not uh, something that you should uh, uh, belong. I'm trying hard not to mention uh, countries for the purposes of uh, your conversation and your platform. Mm -hmm. But I've pointed out two examples to indicate that when you are confronted with the situations we are going through, the political oversight, in terms of the political world, and in terms of the philosophy that informs us about our response, is as important as the resources you provide. In other words, you can have your billions of dollars. Your army can never be strong when the idea is defeated. And you continue to inspire us in Ghana and globally that our weakness is to continue to renege for, from this spirit of a pan-African resolve to work together collectively in responding to our problems we can form the alliances we want but when we african nation states with our people do not see the wisdom in pulling together not just at the level of the resources but at the level of the ideas we are bound to be defeated each time and the situation will continue to get worse and we will continue to see that particularly for the young people there is no longer a social mobility out of school into employment, gainful employment, and a sustainable livelihood. Because this social mobility is lacking, the young people will continue to be uh, uh, dispersed, recruited, completely despondent,
and not willing anymore to be the ones who sacrifice and defend their nation states as our forebears did that led us to our independence. What about the, the problem which is posed by the resources in West Africa and the effort or lack of effort to equitably distribute wealth? As in the case of uh, the Niger Delta Belt in Nigeria. Absolutely. Very critical question. It, 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 it comes back to the fundamentals of what leadership is about today. Mm -hmm. And that, for me, is extremely, extremely regrettable. Uh, keep in mind that all the wealth of West Africa has never been exploited to the benefit of all the people equitably. So that in one country, we have people who are living in the wealth that is literally vulgar. I mean, we're talking about building marble houses, <laughs> which, is, which is basically just outrageous. But in the same environment, others are just trying to act a living on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's impossible. Not to mention the very critical areas of education from the primary to uh, 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 middle and, and secondary uh, upwards. So what that is also doing is slowly suffocating the very survival of our nation states. So that when leadership does not understand that the call to serve is first and foremost beyond the interest of the leader, but rather the interest of the people, then we are going to have a deepening of the social crisis that is uh, confronting us. And if you go from different countries to different countries, you see various levels and degrees of how this is happening. There are some of our countries in West Africa, when you arrive in the capital city, yes, you can see some form of organization, even if not what we might call a complete or good organization. But you leave the capital city and start driving into the hinterland. There is literally nothing. Things begin to fade away. But what then is the opposite effect is that once spread out you have access to telephony and internet young people are not able to relate to other young people elsewhere to see what is happening today in terms of earplugs listening to music on the radio or watching current films and so the question is why are we not able to enjoy what our peer group or age group is enjoying elsewhere. And so the young people then easily become radicalized because they feel that they are being denied by their own leadership. And that's why the potential for immediate mass mobilization has also increased. And we saw that in Mali. The other element I wanted to put is the whole question about legality and legitimacy. Mm -hmm. There is a mistake in thinking that Elections give us the legitimacy to govern. The legitimacy to govern is not just based on the constitution that organized an election and legally declared a winner. Once you have won and you have been put in office after you took the oath of office, what becomes legal is how then you are legitimate in the eyes of the people in the good governance in the leadership of service that you bring to the people. Now, you can have the legality to govern, but when you are in the, uh, the environment of posh living with all the incredible convoys and the luxury living, young people are beginning to say, yes, we understand that you were constitutionally elected, but we will rise up and change that legality, which means you are legal as a president, but you are not legitimate in the eyes of the people. And that is what we also see beginning to sprout out. So the demand now is very compelling to change our ways of governance, to deliver the social services that empowers the people. And whilst we are in this conversation, particularly making sure that there is inclusion of diversity, particularly 
at the level of women so that gender inclusion is very important because in many of our countries women are about 51 or even 52 percent but for a very long time they were totally marginalized so we made ourselves poor by marginalizing one segment of society and to that extent inclusion of ethnicity also so that around the table which basically is the cake and the national resources even if it is not 50 50 everybody feels that they can take something home so that if in some areas the roads are tarmac but in other areas simply because we call them rural areas it is not motoral rule there is a problem and in our own country young people are standing on roads and demonstrating and 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 basically suggesting that they will not vote which for me is not also a good advice because your vote is what empowers you to make the change if you refuse to vote the who is going to come and make the change for you then associated with that is the point at which you could be living in your luxurious mansion but you will not be able to sleep in the night it does not matter what electric fences you put up it does not matter what guards you have because the bubble will simply bust and the young people will just come in their huge numbers because population growth continues unabated and we are having massive amounts of people on the streets in our cities and if we are not socially re-engineering our coexistence and building social cohesion it could snap and leaders must understand that and that's why i find it strange that after 10 years you want to still be in office you are just inviting trouble you are just inf you are inviting an uprising that will simply uproot you in office well viewers we are talking to my old very good friend mr emmanuel bombardi who is an advisor and uh, with the united nations on peace building and we are talking about the general security situation in west africa and we'll be talking about other things we're going to take a short break here and when we come back i would like him to focus on on our historical legacy in places like the cameroon in ghana recently and so on where people are going back to history and saying that no we do not belong here what are the factors at play and how can we deal with this situation probably we'll start with southern cameroon short break Well, hello and welcome back to Talk Time. And we are talking peace. We are talking about the situation in the West African sub-region. And uh, we are privileged to have in the studio Mr. Emmanuel Bombardi, who has been working on peace for so many years. I mean, since I last met him, you know, he's been working on peace for so many years and is now working with the United Nations. Now, sir, Southern Cameroon, the human rights abuses and so on. Bottom line, the people want to go back to the division between French and English. What is the current situation in Southern Cameroon? Yeah, thank you so much. And let me quickly make a 30 seconds disclaimer that for People who do not understand, in order to be proactive, the UN created a small a small unit called the Mediation Support Unit. And I belong to a small team of advisors. Now, the difference between me and officials is that I'm encouraged to have the largesse to bring truth to power and to be very frank. And that's why your typical UN official who has a position will not talk the way I am talking. That's the difference. Exactly. I'm an advisor and not holding an official position. And, and to so, that extent... So, so you don't speak for the UN? No, I don't speak for the UN. But you work for the UN? I work for the UN. Yeah. I report to New York, and I work out of New York uh, many times of the year, and anywhere in the world that I am uh, assigned to, to be able to uh, contribute. Now, I think the question about Southern Cameroon is very, very important, because later on we'll see why it is different from other situations such as us and it's wrong when people try to make the comparisons and then and then arrive at assumptions 
So first of all, we went through the history of balkanization. For the purposes of time, I cannot go back into our history of slavery and the slave trade. But we all know what we went through in terms of the dehumanization and the indignity we suffered as the African race. But let me fast forward that. That in 1884, 1885 at the Berlin Conference, we were balkanized. But keep in mind that in this balkanization and colonization, what then happened was territories that have been colonized by Germany as a result of the Allied victory against the Hitler German army, these territories were taken away and reassigned mostly in our region to the French or to the British. So the Southern Cameroons distinctly was basically now a British uh, territory before independence. They are distinct in language because they speak English. But it's not just the language. Because if you leave it at the language, people do not understand that. There are systems, whether it is legal, which is the English common law, the education of their children, the systems that were set up, education, hospitals, was all totally Anglophone. Now, what would then happen down the line is that as the negotiations for the independence of Cameroon began, the first leaders of Cameroon wanted to be very persuasive to the Anglophones that if we come together, there is more to our advantage than when we get our independence in smaller groups. And that was then aided by a lot of the type of support for what such an integration would mean. And there came the conditionalities if that should happen. For example, the idea that it should be a federated state was appealing to Southern Cameroonians. The idea that we will be allowed to continue with our systems even in an integrated Cameroon was uh, somewhat acceptable. And to that extent, people did not necessarily and forcefully go against the idea. Though, a plebiscite was also organized. But the persuasions and the political engagement now made it possible for the Southern Cameroonians to agree to a federated republic uh, of Cameroon. But what then happened was that after independence, the promises were no longer coming forth. So the, the whole idea of a federal government would now later on be changed into a unitary system of governance. But it's significant that Southern Cameroonians now begin to talk about the marginalization of their region. If you talk about the hydro, uh, hydrocarbons, if you talk about uh, timber, if you talk about mining resources, overwhelmingly, Southern Cameroons is very wealthy. Then the Northeast, which also was in this system, would then be aligned to what we would call the Anglophone uh, section of Cameroon. So what you then saw happening was that people felt the country was doing relatively well in some parts, but the areas that were not doing well in terms of uh, infrastructure investment, roads, hospitals, <coughs> and so on and so forth, was in the Anglophone uh, parts of Cameroon. And that's then when the agitation will begin. So in this narrative, when you talk about the need for a change that is built on a just cause in order to stop marginalization, it presents a unique example. Though from the perspective of the United Nations, our approach is how do you talk about this non-violently so that we do not have human suffering. Mm -hmm. As we talk, human suffering has been incredible. There are women who gave birth to babies in forests, in displaced camps. Why do we do this to ourselves as Africans? There are intolerable living conditions of people in displaced situations. The humanitarian disaster is impossible. Then as all this is going, in summary, as I have painted, I could have spoken for this for one hour, we are then hit with a global pandemic of COVID-19. So in March, the Secretary General issued an appeal, appealing to our global community, because of the stress that we are going to go through with COVID-19, because of the uncertainties, 
we none of us can predict how long this is going on how much more high it will end can we resolve that internally to each of our countries we find a mechanism of building consensus on dialogue it doesn't matter how difficult a situation may be so that we can alleviate human suffering and concentrate on how everybody at the level of equity can get the right protection to fight the pandemic mm -hmm. without talking globally in cameroon one of the groups respected this appeal two of them had conditionalities if the government side could also lay down their arms but what that started to happen was that the humanitarian situation was further aggravated the second observation is when there is a problem sometimes the problem in its magnitude can be contained where it is and reduced minimized and contained even if not completely resolved but if the response becomes in itself a bigger problem than the problem that the response is trying to deal with you <coughs> overwhelm the problem and make it bigger so what then started to happen was that in response to the insurgency by the armed groups in the anglophone or southern cameroons we saw a situation in which it has been described with evidence basically pointing to atrocities and uh, human rights abuses who then added to the dimension and the impetus of trying to resolve this problem not by further accentuating it mm -hmm. in the response who then abuses people's rights mm -hmm. and makes uh, human suffering unbearable and as we have seen it evolve we are at the stage in which it's a stalemate let me add here that <coughs> through preventive diplomacy a lot of effort has been put in by the united nations to try and create the space for dialogue now the united nations has been careful not to be seen to be in the lead because the united nations was also accused by some aspects of the analysis that you do not govern well the plebiscite mm -hmm. and that maybe some of us actually do not want a federated mm -hmm. uh, cameroon but it's the way the plebiscite was organized in fact some people go to the extent that the framing of the questions mm -hmm. was not even understood properly mm -hmm. and that that's what led to the decision as it came to be mm -hmm. but whether we like it or not the un can only play an intermediary role so that the the, the space can be enhanced for that to happen but here's the dilemma we might have issues in terms of particularly where we are at the level of ECOWAS in engaging on these issues but we know that ECOWAS has brought some contribution even if in many situations it was not perfect but imagine that Cameroon belongs to the Central Africa region where the economic community which is called ECAS the economic community of Central African state is very weak mm -hmm. and very dysfunctional though in the past two years thanks to efforts by the special representative of the un for west africa and the sahel uh, our own uh, mohammed ibn chambas a lot of effort has been made to bridge the ECOWAS experience to go into acres and a lot of reforms have begun they've actually just finished the first level of reforms to change the secretariat of acres into a commission and to appoint commissioners but we are still going to see some time before the results begin to take effect but the, the point is that when the region is weak politically you are not able to help a country that is in need but at the second level none of these countries excuse my language is politically better than the other <laughs> so who will help whom and so we have a situation in which it's not just at the regional level that we see the weakness but we also see it in each of the countries central africa republic where i spent most of 2017 and some of 2018 mm -hmm. and 2017 was when we handed over in january after three months when i got back into the un it was my first uh, uh, assignment and a lot of my work was to try and design the type of processes that will lead to the dialogue which then eventually happened in Khartoum mm -hmm. in February 2019 and then came out with the agreement that was later signed in Bangui 
but very difficult to implement even as we speak. And it was very important that you meet each of the armed groups. And so I was in a team that flew in all the jungles of Central African Republic to meet the armed groups. And there were many cases I was overwhelmed. You talk with somebody like General Siddiqui. He says, what right do people have to invade my community, take our cattle, simply because they say we are Fulani and we do not belong. So we understood that when we arm ourselves, when you come, we fight you to protect our people and to protect our animals. And nobody should come and tell them that peace means we should drop those arms and engage. The condition would be proof to us that we will no longer be raided. Our women will not be raped. raped. Our animals will not be taken. So each of these armed groups had their story to tell. But our role is to appeal that under the impossible conditions, how do we still bridge mm -hmm. a common front for the good of the entire country and not for sectional interests, which, as you can see, continues to be different. I can go country by country, uh, Congo Brazzaville, DRC. The time will not allow to do the analysis of each country. But this is the fragility of that region. And for that matter, it has weighed on what you see happening in Cameroon. And for that matter, the southern Cameroons. Because who is the interlocutor? Who is the true bridge builder? So the UN Office for Central Africa, which is UNOCA, the equivalent of UNOWAS, mm -hmm. has been doing everything possible. But the circumstances continue to be extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. The only way is that however difficult it might be, only dialogue will resolve this. But the moment you mention that, the question would be, so who are we going to dialogue with? Mm -hmm. Now we've gone past that. And there is now an acceptance of a dialogue. But there are certain nitty-gritty issues that still need to be uh, mm -hmm. brought to the fore before we see a tangible progress uh, in Cameroon. Now in Cameroon, <coughs> the, some of the elements in the South have declared an independent republic of Ambazonia. Yeah. How does that complicate or help to resolve the conflict? It complicates it in the sense that they have formed to themselves an entity. <clears throat> but what people must realize is they have occupied a territory and they have a fighting army on that territory and they are able to confront the government with their own armed groups. The government completely <coughs> angry and frustrated at that will respond by fighting these armed groups who are in that territory in order to take it completely over. And even where these people are not in a particular territory but have an influence over big towns like Bamenda, the government would like to make sure that they do not come near. So here, they have established for themselves a certain recognition that if you don't talk with us, this can be protected for many years to come. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the challenge is, are you going to kill all the people who are holding arms as a solution? Mm -hmm. If you were even capable of doing that, look at the consequences of what you do at the end of the day. And that is what should inspire the creativity. That it's no longer about the might of a standing army. It's about the wisdom that says coexistence does not mean we like what you have done or we agree with what you have done. Mm -hmm. But to be able to understand at first hand why in the first place we have found ourselves at this level. That now becomes meaningful. And maybe it is possible to negotiate a return to peaceful coexistence, which will be completely different from other scenarios. Yes. Well, viewers, we are talking to Mr. Emmanuel Bombardi, uh, who has established himself as a peace builder. We are talking about generally the situation in West Africa. And we've spoken about some of the specific you know, countries. We've spoken about Mali, Burkina Faso, Guinea, Nigeria. And we've spoken about the Cameroon. 
which normally does not fall within West Africa, but because the Ambazonians claim to be West Africa, it becomes relevant when we are discussing West African issues. Now we're going to take a short break, and after the break, we are going to zoom in into Ghana. As over the last two weeks, there have been some very disturbing occurrences in Ghana, especially in the Volta region of Ghana. So we're going to zoom in to Ghana pretty shortly after this short break. Short break. Welcome back to Talk Time, and we are talking with Mr. Emmanuel Bombardi, who spends all his time discussing and promoting peace. Now, sir, last week and this week, there have been disturbing reports in some parts of the Volta region. And it's been claimed that there's an active secessionist movement in the region. What is your evaluation of what is happening in Ghana, especially in the Volta region or parts of the Volta region? Mm. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you so much. In the context of what has hit us in the Volta region, it is very important that we have a narrative that is the objective narrative and that is the truth. We are suffering from a deliberate distortion of a history to justify secession and that is the challenge the voter region that we have today is a creation of the modern state of ghana which since 2019 has even been recreated with the northern part of the region as the Uti region the voter region is never the same as transvolta togolan so in some of the history that i've narrated between 1884 when we were balkanized into our different segments mm -hmm. up to 1916 you had what was transvolta togoland as western german togoland then it became transvolta togoland when all these territories were confiscated uh, uh, from the germans it's very clear that the southern part of the volta region was never part of this arrangement it was part of the gold coast colony it's like from where I come from in the north, we were part of the northern territories. And then we would now later on become part of the Gold Coast when we, we, we were added. In that case, you can talk about the addition that came. But in the southern part of the Volta region, they were already part of the Gold Coast. So where does the deliberate distortion fit into that narrative that it's the Volta region that wants secession, mm -hmm. and for that matter, you have attacks in some areas mm -hmm. of the Volta region. Mm -hmm. So that, for me, is the first area of dishonesty, because that has a security Im implication in itself. And uh, very closely uh, related to that is that some of the people who are propagating this narrative are also not sincere and I'm not demonstrating integrity. I want to be very respectful. How can somebody who served in the parliament of the Fourth Republic be very public in his statements that the Republic of Ghana is illegal because there was no mm -hmm. act of a union? Then why were you serving in parliament? Why were you representing your people in the parliament of Ghana? Fantastic. Which is the parliament of the Republic of Ghana in the Fourth Republic. Mm -hmm. It is very important for us to appeal that the older we grow, the more we should have a sense that when the day comes and we are called, we should leave this earth with the full knowledge that our children and our grandchildren would have a better and peaceful life to live. When we are at an old age and we join in the distortion of a narrative, it is not good. And that is why I wanted to start from this level and to link it to uh, 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 what is happening? What is the security imp implication? When you are deliberately distorting a narrative, you are doing so many things to change what people know and are trying to build on. For example, the act of the declaration of Ghana's independence is very clear. Now, all of us 
regret what we went through up to the point when our forebears and founder Dr. Kwame Nkrumah led us to independence. It was not an easy process. So how do you today begin to undermine that by trying to call for a different type of a scenario when you know that that act exists and everybody knows about it? So what you then see such a distortion doing is that the narrative in itself begins to divide the social fabric. It tears us apart and it now makes it possible for people to begin to look at each other with suspicion. And that now begins to have a security implication of what this means. So that when we are not careful to quickly rally around and have that one narrative, as the people of Ghana, the danger is that very quickly we can find ourselves totally polarized. And that polarization happens even when you see young people recruited, recruited into doing something that they have no education about, they have no knowledge about, but they are following the convictions and the passions of people who are deliberately distorting that narrative. So if this is the understanding, therefore, we can begin to then ask the question. So the attacks that happened in the Volta region on the 25th of September and then again on the 29th of September at the State Transport Corporation Yard, what exactly happened that we were so unprepared that we allowed them to happen? Because each of these attacks psychologically makes people to literally sink on their knees. It's like, how could this be happening in the Republic of Ghana? So that is one. And you don't, we can talk as much as we want, but one of the things I have learned in life is that when there's a problem, you acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. When you acknowledge, it's like you go to a doctor. The doctor is trying to diagnose what is wrong with you. And so they are asking you questions. And you are misleading the doctor or deliberately trying to distort exactly what is happening. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, what help do you think will come from the doctor? Because the information you give is wrong, you are not going to be properly diagnosed. So what is the intelligence that we have that led to these attacks? Is it not true that the early warning signals were very clear? For me, when a group hoists a flag on the building, which is the symbolic presence of the Republic of Ghana in the Volta region, they removed the Ghana flag and hoist their flag. Symbolically, that was an affront and is an insult to our sovereignty. That early warning was enough to be very good at tracking these people and preventing the attacks from happening. Then there was the erection of the signposts mm -hmm. in some parts of the eastern region and also in the uh, Volta region. That was a second major, major early warning. Those signposts were professionally done. In order to be distributed, they had to move around. And that is what happened. Be it as it may, let's all acknowledge that there was a certain failure. So how do we then rally around to respond? When we begin to argue amongst ourselves that, oh, there was nothing wrong. We saw it coming, only that we were uh, just taking our time. It doesn't fit. Uh, it doesn't uh, resonate <coughs> with uh, what people want. And keep in mind that when these things start, they have the tendency of creating an environment of anxiety that then can perpetuate itself and now make it very difficult to solve. And so we are where we are. I've heard, and I think yesterday, I've heard uh, our Vice President, uh, Alaji Dr. Baumia, talk about the importance of being multi-partisan, all political parties, let's work together. I fully support it. But you see, I want the appeals to be commensurate with the actions. Mm -hmm. You see, the, the value and the ethic can be stated in terms of let's work together. But when it is not translated to the action in which Ghanaians truly see us working together, then it lacks integrity. So the first sign is that yesterday the Volta Regional Caucus met with the Regional Minister. That's a good point of departure. And let us hope that for the sake of our peace and security, our social cohesion, our coexistence peacefully, we will now see more of such approaches to work together.
have a common approach, get to the young people with good conscientization and education to completely disengage from those who have misled them and create an environment where we can begin to trust again. Mm -hmm. If we don't do that, then the stories about it, you can call it conspiracy, you can call it the preparation for things yet to come because there are perceptions you cannot dismiss them i always say that a conflict is happening not because of the subjective reality at play but also the perception mm -hmm. now the perception might not be objective but you cannot dismiss it i remember one time we were stuck in class and one of my professors wanted he was very good at using metaphors he says if you are a man and you come home at 10.30 p.m. and your wife is angry with you and the following day you come at 11.30 and she is even more angry and the third day you come at midnight, it is no longer the time you are coming home. There must be something wrong in the relationship. So, madam, instead of complaining about the time he's coming home, the question should be what is happening between us that makes you to come home at midnight? Because he's probably coming home at midnight hoping to come and see you sleeping. Mm -hmm. And that is why how we begin to rally around together is then interconnected. And what is the interconnection here? We cannot pretend that less than three months before an election, what is happening cannot be interconnected with the election. So you need to build the trust and confidence of the people by appealing to their level of perception and disabusing that perception in the way and manner they see you acting. Now, keep in mind, some people in the voter region are still healing from the role of the army during the voter registration exercise in which some of these army uh, what you would call soldiers went beyond the traditional role of trying to protect people by invading into their privacy and i'm saying this because of the video evidence not necessarily because of what we heard mm -hmm. People have not totally recovered from that. So how you deal with this is to immediately take the disposition that whatever was your perception due to the unfortunate incidences during the voter registration exercise, this is a national cause. We are going to work together. We will listen to everybody's good counsel and good advice so that we secure a peaceful voter region, which is a peaceful Ghana. But when people begin to see any sense of a continuation, they are going to say, what did we say? It is going to reinforce the negative perceptions. It is going to reinforce the mistrust. And it is going to make elections more difficult. And I think this type of interconnection is very, very important. And I thought that if I look at the narrative from where I began, it is not as we talked about it in uh, Southern Cameroon. The, the, the plebiscite of May 1956 did not say there will be a certain period in which we revisit this. The interesting uh, phenomenon here is when it became obvious that in the preparation for independence there were uh, variables to consider. Because prior to all this, by 1954, we had situations in which, yes, for good reasons, when the 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 the, the airways felt that some of us are going to be in. Uh, what you would call the French Togoland and then the British Togoland and the Gold Coast. So we will have always in three different entities. We will want to be together. But what was decisive is that first of all there was a commission, I mean a, a delegation that studied the situation. And I think the decision to consult the people was a good decision. Let them make the informed decisions that would affect generations yet unborn. And when at the end of the day, and a lot of work goes into how you prepare this, mm -hmm. when at the end of the day they agreed to join the plebiscite and the decision was made, the decision was made. The act of independence was passed. Ghana became the Republic of Ghana. This is the narrative, which is the single narrative that we should all use in making sure that we build our peace and not allow confusion and distortion to become part of our narrative of the development of the modern state of Ghana. And that is why I like the attitude of engaging. 
And that has happened already. Because some of the people promoting the agenda of secession have appeared on television and radio stations. But for heaven's sake, they should not distort the narrative. And if anything at all, they should have understood by now that Ghanaians have rejected that narrative. So let's go back to what is the truth and build our, uh, our peace. And let me add on to that now. That from your first question and the discussions around your first question, the region is sitting in the middle of total disarray of insecurity. Why will we in Ghana create conditions within us that makes us now vulnerable for some of the elements we talked about as extremists and terrorist groups to infiltrate and cause more mayhem? Is that what we want? And that at the end of the day, when I leave you here, when all of us, your team, when we go home, what do we have for dinner before we go to bed? Can we have clean drinking water when we want to go to bed and tomorrow morning? Can we take a good shower? Can our children have access to education? And when somebody in the family is sick, can there be good health care? These fundamentals are our preoccupation today. And assuming, assuming that we should reason on the side of those who are thinking secession, what benefit are you going to get by carving that path? You are actually going to entrap people in more poverty. Our population of 30 million is not significant enough to run a robust economy. How much more the reduction that you want to bring? Look at Nigeria, 200 million people. Look at what they are going through. So isn't it obvious that the argument right from the beginning that the Pan-African agenda would have made us to be more prosperous? Isn't it so obvious that that is what we continue to lack? So why would people go counter? And this is happening in the year that Ghana, selected through an AU process, is the secretariat of AFTA to bring integration through trade. And some people are running in the counter direction. So let's convince ourselves about what is the truth, not because we are arguing about the geography of the modern state of Ghana, but we are arguing about how that brings the basic necessity of life to our people. So that at the end of the day, it doesn't matter where you are in Ghana, livelihood and living, the environment is created for everybody to feel that I can have a little of the cake and I can be happy with that little. And that gradually will increase the cake and everybody will have a bigger portion. But we cannot do that in an environment of needless conflict, a distortion of history, deliberately for some people to have probably positions they dream about that they might never get. And once they do that, they impoverish our people and put them more into misery. I think this would be my take on that. Well, viewers, we'd like to thank you very much for allowing us into your homes. And please don't forget the Pan-African television always brings you the best. Today we've been talking to Mr. Emmanuel Bombardi, and you heard him. Brilliant, outspoken, articulate, and all. We do have problems in West Africa. Some of the problems are a legacy of our history of slavery, our history of classical colonialism, and our history of new, our continuing history of neocolonialism. Please stay with us until we meet again next week where we'll bring you more interviews and more discussions. It's goodbye from all of us from Pan-African Television, from our producer, director, Adam Lumo, from management, from all of us, makeup staff, cameramen, soundsmen, and so on. Goodbye. We'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.